All I wanted when I was a kid was to go to summer camp. Every summer, I would beg my parents to send me, but they always said the same thing. It's too expensive, or it's too far away, or we can't afford to drive out there when you get homesick. I know, summer camps have fallen out of popularity these days, but they were just about the coolest thing to a kid in the early 90s. Every show had a summer camp episode. There were movies with summer camps. There were even music videos on MTV about summer camps, for God's sake. I felt like I was missing out on a big part of my childhood experience by not being allowed to go, but every year I was forced to sit at home and wish. So when Mom told me that she had found a summer camp for me when I was 11, I was ecstatic. Camp Moonsong was an all-girls camp about an hour from our house, and the fee for 60 days stay was surprisingly low. Low enough to make Mom suspicious that it was some sort of front for a sweatshop or something, and she read over the paperwork very carefully with my dad. I remember just hovering outside the kitchen as they went over it, Dad not showing her level of dedication as he held paperwork in one hand and smoked with the other. They... they talk about not being responsible for injuries or accidents a lot in this stuff. I remember Mom saying, and then sighing when Dad scoffed. Dad just being careful, Wendy. Sounds perfect, honestly. She's been begging to go to one for years. If we don't send her before 13, I think she'll miss her chance. You know 12's usually the cutoff on these kinds of things. They discussed it for a while, and when they finally came and said I could go, I was overjoyed. I had my bags packed before the last week of school was even out. And on the second day of summer vacation, my mom and dad drove me to the camp for drop-off. It was beautiful. One of those camps like you see on TV. It was in the middle of the woods with a bunch of little cabins next to a lake. And I could see a boathouse, hiking trails, archery courses, and all kinds of things that I was chomping at the bit to go try. We met the head counselor at the main cabin, a smiling blonde lady named Gladys. And after some hugs and some last-minute checks of my stuff, my parents headed out, and I was shown to the Sparrow Cabin, where I would be staying for the next 60 days. That is where I met Lauren, Sandy, Heather, and Claire, the girls who would be my cabin mates. Sandy and Heather were 12, and this was their first time at Moonsong, but not at sleepaway camp. Lauren was 10, and she had never been to camp either, so... This was a first for both of us. Claire, however, had been coming here for about three years, and she was the only one of us who didn't look excited. She was trying to put on a brave face, clearly not wanting to spook us, but her mood was kind of off. Claire was also our cabin captain, so when the loudspeaker came on, welcoming us and telling us to meet at the pavilion for orientation, she led the way. The pavilion turned out to be a small amphitheater, a stone stage with rows of concrete seats leading up and out of it. We took a seat at the section near the stage, all of us chatting animatedly, except for Claire, as the other cabins assembled. Each cabin had five girls, there were six cabins in all, Sparrow, Magpie, Grouse, Dove, Hawk, and Crow. They had all spread out a little, giving each cabin room to gather, and as we all sat chattering, the camp counselors arrived to start the orientation. "'Welcome, welcome, welcome, campers,' said Gladys, her voice echoing off the stone benches, "'and welcome to another exciting year at Camp Moonsong.'" There were a few other adults on the stage, and she introduced them as the activity directors. There was a counselor for swimming, canoeing, archery, hiking, nature studies, physical challenges, and arts and crafts. Gladys told us how our daily schedules would be posted on the bulletin board outside of our cabins at first light, and that each day would end with a marshmallow roast at the fire pit. And don't forget, the fire pit is where we choose that night's sleepwalker, she said, something that brought nothing but polite claps from some of the campers. I saw more than a few of them that looked like Claire when she said it, and I realized there might be something a little strange at work here. Our first activity was archery, so 
Claire took us back to the cabin to get ready. So, what's with the sleepwalker thing? I asked, Heather chiming in as well as Claire went to go get a shirt that was a little more comfy. It's nothing, she said, stripping out of her polo and slipping on a t-shirt. It's just something that Camp Moonsong does. It, it doesn't mean anything. It's just tradition. What do you mean? I asked, the four of us falling in behind her as we headed for the range. She made a frustrated noise, rounding on us angrily. Just, just don't worry about it. If you're lucky, it won't be a problem anyway. There's 30 of us. The chances are good that a few of you might never have to see it, she said. The last more to herself than anything. See what? I asked. But she ignored me as we came to the archery course. We had archery, arts and crafts, and a trip to the lake that day. And by the time the sun set and the bonfire sprang to life, I found I'd quite forgotten about the sleepwalker. We spent a while roasting and eating marshmallows, singing songs, telling spooky stories, and then I saw Gladys step close to the fire with a box that rattled a little. Some of the girls looked at it ominously, Claire among them, but Gladys was all smiles. Okay, campers, it's time to pick tonight's sleepwalker. You returning campers know how it works. If you reach into the box and draw out the black ball, you're tonight's sleepwalker. I snorted, not quite sure why this had some of them so worried. What, were they going to come and scare us in our cabin if one of us drew the black ball? Would we have to scare people? What was this, I wondered, because it all seemed kind of ridiculous. The box had barely gone through five people when a girl of about eight got the black ball. It was clearly her first time here because she seemed pleased but mystified as she handed Gladys back the ball. Gladys asked what her name was, and then announced that Brenda was the summer's first sleepwalker. After that, we all went back to our cabins, even Brenda, and I remember sitting up a little with the other girls and whispering about how silly it all was. Were they trying to scare us or something? Ooh, sleepwalkers, we all said as we laughed, but when Claire told us to go to sleep, she said something that took the starch out of our sheets. Wait till tomorrow morning. Then we'll see if you still think it's funny. She was right. The bugle woke us up the next morning, and we all shuffled to breakfast in the mess hall. Amidst the chomps of cereal, toast, eggs, and bacon, I heard someone sniffling loudly. It wasn't normal sniffling, like the kind you get from someone being homesick. This was different, and I didn't have words for it yet. I do now, now that I've grown up a little. It's the hopeless kind of sniffling from someone who's lost something they can't get back, like a mother or a wife crying for a husband or a child. I glanced over at the crow table and saw that it was Brenda. She looked terrible, like she hadn't slept at all, and the circles under her eyes looked more like bruises. She wasn't eating, despite how the girls in her cabin tried to coax her, and her eyes seemed to weep constantly. The crow table was next to ours, and she seemed to be telling them in between sobs that she wanted to go home. They were trying to talk her out of it, saying that the chances were low that she would draw it again, and after a few days, she would forget all that she had seen. I didn't exactly know what to make of them, but I would learn. For the next week and a half, I watched as different girls drew the black ball. The ones who had been here before took it better than the new ones. And the new ones were always in tears the next day. Because of how the schedules were set up, we really didn't have a lot of interaction with the other cabins. We lived with the girls in our cabin, but outside of meals and the fire pit, we didn't see the others during the day. Most of them stuck pretty close to their groups during the periods in between activities, and none of them wanted to talk about what was going on if you asked them. Then, about a week and a half after Brenda drew the ball, Heather drew out the jet black sphere and was that night's sleepwalker. I remember the look on her face when she drew it out, the look of uncertainty and fear, and Gladys named her the sleepwalker of the night. She went back to the sparrow cabin, seeming unsure of what to expect, and as we got ready for bed, we all watched her a little apprehensively. So, 
Heather asked. What happens now? Do I start walking or something? Do they come and get me in the night? Maybe they're going to make you disappear, Lauren said, and we all laughed nervously. Just go to sleep, Claire said, and it shut us all up as we looked at her. It won't happen till then. She slid under her blankets and slid a pillow over her head. So we all settled in, turning the lamp off and nestling down for sleep. Heather was soon snoring, as was Lauren, and I yawned as I drifted off as well. I guessed if something was going to happen, then it would happen. Before I knew it, I was dreaming about swimming and friendship bracelets and all the other things I was going to do tomorrow. I woke up in the middle of the night, filled with a need to pee worse than anything I'd ever felt. I was coming back from the latrines, almost back in bed, when I glanced at Heather and saw something that stopped me in my tracks. Heather's mouth was open in a silent O oh of a scream. Her hands were bunched up in the covers, and she was writhing slowly on the sheets of her small bed. Her eyes were closed, shut tight like they might be locked that way, and she sucked in breath like she might be screaming in whatever dream she was having. I woke the others, showing them what was happening, and when Sandy reached out to shake her, Claire grabbed her by the wrist. It won't do any good, and it could make it worse. You just have to let her get over it on her own. But we can't just leave her like this. She's in pain, Sandy said. She could be in more pain if you wake her up. She'll come out of this at dawn, so just let her be. We went back to bed, none of us but Claire sleeping, and when the sun came up, Heather came awake, shaking like someone who's been startled badly. She looked around like something might be after her, like this might all be a dream too, and when we came to comfort her, she began to sob. Her eyes had the same dark circles that I'd seen on the other girls, and she walked to chow when the bugle sounded like a zombie. She didn't eat breakfast, and when I asked her what she dreamed about, Claire shot me a nasty look. We don't talk about it. The worst thing you can do is to make her relive it. But if we know what happens when you're the sleepwalker, if you're lucky, Claire said, talking over me as my voice rose, you'll never have to find out. No, Heather said suddenly. No, I, I, I want to talk about it. Claire got a pained look. You don't have to. I know what it's like. It's, it's not something you should have to relive. Wait, I said putting something together that I should have a while ago. You knew this was going to happen, and you didn't warn us. Why didn't you say something? Because it wouldn't have done any good, Claire said. Knowing it's coming doesn't make it any easier. It's terrible, no matter if it's the first time or the fifth. I got chosen twice last year. The knowing doesn't matter. It's terrible. Every time. Do you want to know or not? Heather said, turning to us angrily. Because I'm only going to tell it once, and then I never want to talk about it again. We said we did, and she got a faraway look as she began. I was in the woods. It was, it was night, and everything was dark. And I felt something watching me, something like a tiger or a bear or something. It was big, whatever it was, because cause when it roared, it, it shook all the trees around me. I started running, running through the woods as fast as I could. You say I was in bed, but my legs ache and my, my arms feel the pine needles that slashed at them. I ran and ran and ran, but it, it never seemed to catch me. It was always just out of sight, just out of reach. And the farther I ran, the more afraid I got. After a while, I felt like, like I was going crazy. I was so scared, so ab absolutely terrified, and it just, it just never ended. Then, just as the sun came up, I heard it roar and I heard the trees rustle as it jumped and I fell down as something heavy hit me. Then I woke up and you guys were standing there looking at me. She started crying then and Claire gave her a hug as she assured her that it was over. She was safe now. Needless to say, Heather decided to stay in when we saw it was our turn to hike today. She had spent a whole night in the woods and saw no reason to spend another hour looking at nature. 
That's how it went that summer. Every night, we drew the balls from the box, and every night it was some girl's turn to spend it in a state of terror. Sandy got her turn, Laura too. Even Claire had to suffer it one night. But never me. Some of the girls went twice, but I seemed to be immune to the black ball. It never chose me. If it hadn't been for the team challenge, I, I would never have experienced it. Team challenge was Gladys's idea, and she was clearly proud of it. It was the last week of camp, and I'd almost thought I would get away without having to be the sleepwalker. We were gathered for the morning meeting after breakfast, and all of us assembled in the amphitheater. Gladys stood up there, smiling like she had a big surprise for us. And I suppose she was right. Good morning, 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 campers. This week I have something special planned. Today we start the team challenges. Two cabins will face each other in three events. Archery, canoe races, and obstacle course. The winner will be immune to sleepwalking for that night. The losing cabin, however, will all have to be the sleepwalkers that night. No one cheered, but... We all knew the stakes. The way it shook out was for three days the cabins would compete. On the fourth day, one of them would get the bye, and the other two would face off. On the fifth day, the last two would go head to head for the crown of best cabin. Saturday would be color war and then pick up. Claire took us aside and told us we had to win this. Everyone in the cabin's been the sleepwalker at least once. Well, almost all of us, she said, looking at me jealously. I didn't feel good about it. Quite the contrary, I felt terrible. Heather had been the sleepwalker twice, Sandy too, and I hadn't been picked once. I didn't want to either. I'd watch them go through it, and it looked miserable. As it happens, though, I had one of the best times on the obstacle course, and I was one of the better campers on the archery range. I felt we had a good chance of winning this thing, and the girls agreed as we started making a game plan. The Sparrows beat the Crows on Tuesday, and when we got the bye on Thursday, we were hopeful that we could win this thing, and the incentive was on full display. The losing team showed up to breakfast with bags under their eyes, shaking noticeably as they refused to eat. Whatever was going on, it was even worse in a group, and we were prepared to win against the Hawks and take the whole contest. We had them at archery, but they smoked us at the canoe race. We were certain that we could whip them at the obstacle course, but that's when disaster struck. As Claire came across the final leg of the course, having gone last so I could go first and give us a strong start, she slipped and fell off the beam the race going to our opponents. The Hawks won, and we would be the sleepwalkers that night. We fought it, trying to stay up as late as we could, trying to stay up all night, but we were just so tired. By eleven, we were all dozing. By midnight, we lost the fight. I remember blinking owlishly as I watched Claire drifting off fitfully. When I opened my eyes, I was in the forest. We were all in the forest, looking around as we awoke into some kind of strange shared dream. I was just trying to orient myself when I heard the roar that Heather had described, and it galvanized me in a way that nothing ever had. It was like a bear's roar mixed with something feline and something much deeper. I imagined it was a Tyrannosaurus Rex, the scream of some extinct creature come back to life and I started running. They were with me in the beginning, all of us neck and neck as we fled into the woods. It was always behind us, stomping through the trees like it was as tall as a redwood. It crashed, it rumbled, and as we ran for our lives, it menaced us from the darkness. Heather was the first to fall. I looked back, meaning to help her, but the darkness swirled up and took her. Her tear-streaked, terrified face was there one moment, and suddenly she was swallowed up by the gloom. Laura fell next, stumbling as she looked back at Heather, and I didn't look back to see what gobbled her up. 
I kept running, kept showing my heels, and when Sandy fell too, I, I didn't even notice right away. I was in a state of panic, something I would later call a heightened terror response when I went to college to study psychology. It was similar to the response prey animals have when they're fleeing for their lives, a kind of thing that gets them eaten by pack hunters when another one pops up on the side while they're focused on the threat behind them. I ran and ran and ran, my legs pumping and my heart racing. I didn't know when Claire fell or even if she did, but I felt the branches that reached out to slow me down and the rocks that battered my bare feet. I felt every mile that I ran and I felt every horrifying stumble as I nearly lost my balance. I kept running for my life and when the sun came up at long last, I didn't stop. I heard it spring, heard it come up from behind me like a tidal wave, but if it hit me, I didn't know about it. I came awake like I meant to fight off an attacker, and the other girls were around me, looking as bad, if not worse. We lost the color war. All of us were too tired to focus. Mom commented on the bruises under my eyes when she came to pick me up, but I just hugged her and said how glad I was to see her. I never spoke about that summer, not until I wrote my senior thesis on the difference between irrational and rational fear in adolescence. I didn't think I would ever visit those memories again, not till today. I've been working as a psychiatrist since I graduated, helping kids get over their trauma and trying to find them some relief. Most of it's normal stuff, divorcing parents or concerned about their school friends. We talk about monsters in closets or stories that won't go away when they close their eyes. Typical little kid stuff, but Sometimes I help them tell parents about someone who's doing something they shouldn't, so that person can go somewhere where they can't hurt them again. Those are the good days, the days I feel like I've made a difference. When the girl started telling me about the dreams, the ones she had after her mother said they had enrolled her in camp again, I felt myself beginning to hyperventilate. She described dreams of something big, chasing her through the woods at night about dreams that only come when she was at camp and only when she was the sleepwalker. I didn't even feel it at first when the pen snapped in my hand and when the girl said her voice panicked that I was bleeding I looked down to see that my hand had the jagged end of a pen buried in it. I told her mother that she might want to find another summer camp this year not voicing what I actually believed, so I didn't sound crazy. The mother seemed concerned, but Jenny loves Camp Moonsong. She's gone every year since she was nine. I strongly recommended that she find her daughter another camp, and the two left mollified with a prescription refill. I had never imagined the place was still open, never in my wildest dreams. I sat in my office, trying to control the shakes as my hand throbbed like an infected tooth. I'm afraid to go to sleep tonight, something I haven't been afraid of since that first week of camp. I'm afraid I might wake up in the woods again, fleeing the thing that chases the sleepwalkers. You're still here. Thanks so much for joining us for tonight's spooky tale. If you'd like a little bit more spooky in your life, why not click on one of the videos that appears at the end of our story? Or maybe head on over to one of our playlists where you can get your fill of spooky content. If you like your spooky a little more tactile, I've got a new book that's come out. If you'd like your own copy, there's a link below in the description where you can get your own copy of my spooky book. If you like what you see here on the channel and think you might like to support in a more monetized way, then why not come over to Patreon or become a member on YouTube. Speaking of, let's go ahead and thank our members now. Thanks to Siv Garstead, Unicorn Hollow, and Army Dude for being our spooky ghost contributors. Thanks to Janet, Lee Kendall, Psycat, Rhonda J, Sue Casper, and Valinator for being our spooky skeleton contributors. And thanks to O Snap, Hi Stacy, Winter, Zeronin, Stephanie Carrington, Tyler Parker, 
Cinnamon Fox, Grim Reaper, Tomboy Top Uwu, and Queen Sheba for being our Ghostly Reader tier contributors. And a big thanks to Scott Donahue for being our Ghostly Writer tier contributor. Thanks, everyone. We just couldn't do the show without you. If you'd like to support the channel, then come on down to Patreon or become a member on YouTube. Spooky Skeleton tier contributors, that's our $5 tier, get their spooky 12 hours early at 8.30 a.m. as opposed to 8.30 p.m. My time, of course. And while Ghostly Reading is uh, only a tier that's available on Patreon, you get a signed copy of my book anytime I write one on your doorstep in hopefully a timely manner. If you'd like a book, we have many on Amazon. I've got links below if you'd like to follow those. Um, should get you to my page so you can buy any one of my eight books I believe we're up to now. I'm sure they'd look really nice on your shelf and I'll sign them for you if you can find me out in the wild. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.